Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Extracting More Value from Your Data Part 2, Quantitative Optimization of Remedial Design Delineation Through 3D Geostatistical <laughs> Modeling Conference Call, hosted by Scott Hartson, Hartzell. My name is Patrick, and I'm your event operator. During the presentation, your lines will remain on this and only, but if you require assistance at any time, please key star zero on your telephone, and a coordinator will be happy to assist you. You may submit web questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the Q&A tab on the bottom right of your WebEx screen, type your question, and click Send to all panelists. These will be answered during the Q&A session. I'd like to advise all parties this conference is being recorded, and now I'd like to hand over to Scott. Please go ahead. Thank you, Patrick, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a very great pr presentation for you today. This is part two of a two-part series on extracting more value from your data. Uh, Jim Schutz is with us today, and he's going to discuss how to apply some 3D geostatistical modeling to uh, extracting that uh, value by uh, optimizing remedial design. So, Jim, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Scott. Just next slide, please. We have a, a few housekeeping items. Um, as mentioned, all your phones are on mute, but you can submit questions through the Q&A uh, section of the, uh, the WebEx. And we ask that you would uh, give us your name and location when you do so in case we need to follow up with any, uh, any answers to questions that we don't get through during the call today. A quick agenda, we'll give you a bit of an introduction to, uh, to Jim, our speaker. Uh, he will deliver a core value moment as we usually do on uh, these kind of webinars. And then he will uh, go ahead with the presentation and we'll save, uh, save 10 minutes or so at the end for any uh, questions and answers. Jim is a uh, principal hydrogeologist with Parsons in our Buffalo office. He's also a technical manager of our environmental geological services. He directs our uh, pr uh, group that does hydrogeology and groundwater modeling. And one thing that I found out about Jim that I did not know before that he might be interested in is before he came to Parsons, he worked as an exploration geologist in both Greenland and Africa. So very interesting. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Scott. For the core value moment today, I'd like to discuss diversity. And frankly, I've changed out this diversity slide a few times and updated it as soon as um, just before this meeting. Um, I think we are living in unprecedented times, not only because of COVID-19, but um, you know, in the wake of the death of George Floyd and the hands of Minneapolis police officer and police officers and the subsequent racial unjust, unjust, unrest and protests that have occurred throughout the country, I think this is an a, a important time for us to not only think about diversity and inclusion, but how do we take it to the next level in terms of openness and expansion. Parsons has always had a strong diversity and inclusion um, core value moment. Um, but I was happy to see and expected to see Parsons um, stepping up to the, the plate here with a more proactive and um, a, aggressive approach in, in terms of how we, how we handle this. Um, George Floyd's death and many other um, minorities and people of color at the death of uh, police officers is unfortunate and should have never occurred. Um, Social injustice and equalities cannot be tolerated. Right now we're at a heightened sensitivity in addition to what has already happened with COVID um, pandemic. So it's only exacerbating, I think, uh, a lot of our emotional response, maybe in a good way, if it takes us to a place where we start to address these issues more directly. Parsons' mission is to deliver a better world, um, and that includes for furthering social justice and safety in communities, offices, and locations in which where we live. So delivering a better world means delivering a better world everywhere, including these social issues that are now um, much more prevalent as they should be. Um, Parsons will not tolerate nor condone hatred, discrimination, or the exclusion of others. That's part of our inclusion and diversity core value. And we encourage open dialogue, inclusion of all employees, and diversity of thoughts because it's the cornerstone of our innovation and culture. 
and a couple of quotes off to the left here. When we listen, when we listen and celebrate what is both common and different, we become wiser and more inclusive and better as an organization. That's from Pat Warders. And secondly, an incident is just the tip of the iceberg, a sign of a much larger problem below the surface. And that what that's what the ongoing debate is now, not only, you know, um, very specific individual tragic deaths, but beyond that in terms of social inequity. So that's the inclusion and diversity moment. Moving on, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my team and people that have supported the geostatistical projects that I'm going to go over today. Um, as the saying goes, there's no I in team. I'll start with Kyla Wyatt, who is our 3D modeler and hydrogeologist with Parsons. Melanie Beck, mathematician and hydrogeologist with Parsons. Dan Griffiths, um, a technical director who I've learned a lot from and continue to collaborate with. Rob Purick, a hydrogeologist who's been in the Buffalo office with me for almost 10 years, who supported many projects, including um, some of the data we're going through today. Taylor Schweigel, geologist at Parsons, um, helping a lot with uh, current projects, not only in structural geology, but in GIS. And Mary Devine, a scientist um, who recently just took a new position, which is great for her career and at the Nuclear Waste Management Organization um, in Canada. And Matt Tonkin at Papadopoulos, um, SSPNA, who um, we're co-collaborating with on um, certain projects and um, laid out some of the groundwork for some of the uh, project specifics that we'll get into. So as an introduction, this is really discussion on modeling as it's used in the environmental and engineering and science. Focus on 3D modeling and geostatistics. This is a similar but different presentation to one that I gave in 2019 in terms of numeric modeling. So this is a, sort of an expansion on that concept of we're talking about models, what do they mean, what are some of the details in those tools, and how do we first talk about the fundamentals and dive into the actual quantitativeness of it so that we can, we can all better understand the tools that we're using, and then really go through some site examples in terms of appro approaches and, you know, the cusp of the problem here, the cusp of this presentation is to extract more data, more value from your data. So what is a model? Um, I come from a numeric modeling background, which to me always seemed like the, you know, more elaborate version, and I sort of had a narrow view on the term on the term model, but it really means so much more. It, it, there's a broad spectrum of the word model, which I think is important to the conversation and how we define it on our projects, what our expectations of our, are of that model, and what the limitations are. So until we know what kind of model we're working with, we're somewhat limited on understanding and appreciating the expectations. So models can go as far as, you know, old toys that uh, folks used to, used to glue together or children used to glue together um, in order to make a replica of something. So a, a toy model car, as you see here. We have 3D printed models, where this is a groundwater treatment plant, um, a set of systems uh, designed to you know, treat groundwater as it's pumped out of the ground. And that's a 3D printed model, so it gives us a perspective of seeing the whole system at work and in you know, one smaller rendition. We have mathematical models, um, which are oftentimes based on fundamental, fundamental physical processes, such as uh, the groundwater flow equation. But we also have mathematical models, like I'll be talking about today, that are geostatistical models based mostly on, mostly on empirical data. And then we have a cat modeling some light fall apparel. Um, so the point, the point is. In order to understand what our models can do for us, we need to understand what they're based in and what their assumptions and limitations are. Conceptual models. So I think we can all appreciate, you know, most of our sites, we do have a good solid conceptual model. It comes in different um, forms. It's usually a written and pictorial representation of an environmental system. It can contain the biology, the physical environment, chemical processes, all these parts that are relevant to the site objective, whether it be remediation or 
um, site investigation, et cetera, et cetera. And quickly on numeric models before we get into the geostatistical approaches, which are often involved with numerical models, but um, I wanted to go over this because I think there's a clear difference between mathematically based, um, well, physically based mathematics and empirically based geostatistics. So typically in a numeric model, it actually uses a physically based algorithm, i.e. a groundwater flow equation, for example, um, and then goes through a, an elaborate process in terms of solving a solution numerically, which is an approximation and uses a convergence criteria, but also becomes, and because of that reason, is an approximation and sometimes or is, is non-unique. Um, you can see the examples at the bottom here in terms of what we would typically think of in numerical groundwater environments, mod flow, and some of its components. And then over here we have examples of different types of grids that are, um, that are used. The important point, and I think the, um, the difference between a numerical model and a geostatistical model is that in, in most cases the numeric model usually has that physical mathematical equation to go with it. So on to the point of today. We're going to talk about geostatistical modeling and really set the basis for some fundamentals in terms of 2 and 3D interpolations, um, go into the fundamental basis of those interpolation tools that we typically use in geostatistics, and then go into some site examples um, after we go through sort of a suite of the, the common tools that we use here at Parsons. So methodologies, data processing, and mathematical algorithms, in order to understand what geostatistics, what type of geostatistics we're doing, we need to set the basis for types of interpolations, because a lot of the statistics are based on spatial relationships and the statistics around that spatiality. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about basic interpolation, talk about data transformation, because that's usually a component in one way or another. I'll talk about Krieging um, and the mathematics behind it. And then I'm going to talk about indicator Krieging and indicator Krieging at multiple thresholds. You'll see, and we'll go into some of it, but there's multiple forms of Krieging. Most of the time, we typically use a standard Krieging um, on our environmental projects, but we're going to go we're going to go deeper into Krieging today. So, with a basic interpolation, you know, how do we understand Krieging? Well, we need to first understand what interpolation is. Interpolation is a mathematical model that predicts a value at any point. So you can see here, which is a data reduction tool, we have original data on the blue line and reduced data on the red um, and, and dashed. So this interpolation tool is designed to take high density data and reduce it down in order for computational um, expense reduction. And what it does is assign an algorithm that can then analytically predict the values between the actual data points and using that prediction or estimation, um, it's no longer residing on the actual sample points itself. So think of a basic linear interpolation that we're probably very uh, all familiar with or um, a triangulated network for a groundwater contour map. It's pretty straightforward. When we take that and that's our starting point in order to talk um, more thoroughly about the higher algorithms in terms of inverse distance weighting and, and, and then Krieging. I think uh, just as a notable point here, um, most of us in science and engineering understand the difference between interpolation and extrapolation. However, you know, when um, facing uh, regulators and, you know, and general public, it might not always be that apparent. So it's important, I think, that we understand that there is a clear difference between interpolation and extrapolation. And most of the time, we're really talking about interpolation, which comes with um, a lot less assumptions than extrapolating out 
into some distance or into some um, future time. So mostly we're talking about interpolation in, in this presentation here today. So before we get into Krieging, I'll talk a little bit here about data transformations. We often have to take our data um, and transform it in one way or another in order to have it better um, aligned with the representation of the physical world. So this is an example here of how we might log transform data in order to use inverse distance weighting interpolation um, in order to devise an estimate amongst the, the data field itself. Um, so what are we looking at? So these red dots here, these are high concentration values amongst lower concentration values in green. When you do an inverse distance weighting on a normal, um, normal linear uh, process, you end up with this mid-value range, which is the mauve or brown color, brownish color, um, and you end up with these bullseyes around each of the green values. Well, as scientists and engineers, we would probably look at this and say, well, actually, we would expect um, green, i.e. low concentrations, up in this field because we have data points that support it, but we don't. We end up seeing this, this mid-range color. And, and so why is that happening? Because these concentrations are so overwhelmingly higher than the green concentrations that the algorithm is basically pushing its way out and predicting values out here based on the high concentrations um, on the other side of the data field. So that's something as scientists and engineers we would see as probably unlikely depending on the conceptual model. And we might be able to look at data from a, from a different way. So oftentimes when you have this high spread in concentrations, you would want to log transform the data and move it into a different space. And as you can see, the log transformation gives a better representation of the, the expected concentrations. So moving on, a quick history lesson here. Um, we've all, a lot of us um, that have done water level contour maps or, you know, spatial interpretations or our GIS folks, um, we, we use this algorithm called Krieging and a lot of times people are unaware of the source of that. So Krieging is from Daniel G. Krieg, who is a, um, a, um, an engineer, a mining engineer in South Africa, and he really pioneered some of the distance weighting averages for, for gold grades. Um, so this term, Krieging, really is based on his work, based on um, his math, and was developed very specifically for the mining industry. And you'll notice some of that when we get into the parameters of Krieging in terms of um, the, the nomenclature. So today we're really going to talk about two types of Krieging, ordinary Krieging and indicator Krieging. There's a plethora, well, maybe not a plethora, there's probably five or eight different types of Krieging algorithms. They follow very similar processes in terms of geospatial interpolation, um, but what they do is there's subtle tweaks on the use of the variance, essentially, as it applies in the Krieging formula, which I'll get into in a minute. So ordinary Krieging, um, a good way to start out thinking about it is in two-dimensional interpolation. A topography map is a good example. Water level contour maps are good examples. Um, there's a variety of mathematical models that we can use for these types of contour maps, whether it be topography or water level contours. Inder, inder, excuse me, inverse distance weighting that I mentioned earlier sounds very much how it works. The farther you get away from uh, estimation point, the, uh, the less weight that actual sample data has on that estimation. So it's inverse distance um, as assigned as a weight. Another example would be triangulated irregular network, which um, is similar to what we would do in you know, a hand contoured map that, um, that we sometimes still use or that we're you know, done uh, and, and taught in, probably in college. And then there's Krieging. 
and that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. So what is Krieging then? So Krieging is like inverse distance weighting, um, and this graphic here shows it pretty well. So we're estimating a point, and this is just one point. This, um, this process would happen everywhere in the gridded field. So if we're going to estimate this data point, this data point is influenced by the surrounding uh, black dots with the white circle around them. Inverse distance weighting would only simply use the distance in order to assign the weight. What Krieging does is it looks out at the data field within a certain radius and analyzes all those data for variance. Um, it, you develop a variogram based on the variance away from the data point. That variogram then is used to assign the weight based on not only the distance, but the variability away from that data point. So instead of it just being a linear inverse distance weighting, the farther you get out, the less influence the point has, there's empirical data that supports that weight in and of itself. So within ordinary Krieging, um, this is a, essentially the, the formula itself. It's the measured value at the ith location, um, and we have an unknown weight for the measured value, and then we have a predicted location, and then we have a number of measured values, so it's done across n. What I think it's important to think about in Krieging, we see this a lot, and um, it's hard for us to visualize why it happens, we discuss it. And, you know, we, we sort of, when we're training younger scientists and engineers, we, we have this, this discussion about why this happens in the Krieg data field, but I think this example plot really shows it well. So this is a one-dimensional interpolation by Krieging. And I want you to focus on the, the red dots. So those are the actual data values and then the Krieg interpolation. And what you notice is the estimated um, Krieg line actually drops below the empirical data. So although you have a minimum value across here, you know, at this point, your actual Krieging interpolation drops below that, and you end up with estimations below your empirical data. And sometimes that causes, um, that causes issue in how we plot our data or how we put our data assignments from the empirical data on an interpolated Krieg data set because there is often, not often, but there is sometimes disconnect, um, a discrepancy between the estimation and the minimum and maximum. The same effect happens in inverse where you can have an estimation point higher than your empirical data, which um, sometimes can rec uh, become an issue within a regulatory environment because you believe that your empirical data are true, but you have an estimation tool that says you may have actual higher concentrations. Now, from a purist geostatistical perspective, I think you can look at it and say, well, it's giving us information about what might be out there that we're unaware of because it's essentially trying to fit this slope where there's a break in the slope, the, curve, the curvy lineature nature of the Krieging algorithm goes beyond the data spread itself. So moving on, Krieging is linear algebra. So you take the first equation that I just showed and you break it down into a matrix in order to apply that algorithm across a gridded environment, whether it be 2D or 3D. So you can tell your friends and, uh, and colleagues and children or nieces and nephews that are taking uh, college math that we actually use linear algebra in our field and uh, it's used on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't have to solve the whole entire matrices ourselves. We have tools that do it for us. So the key component of Krieging comes down to the, uh, the Krieging variogram. A lot of times there's an auto Krieg setting which, which it, within a certain software package that might do the variogram for you, and sometimes that's okay, but 
we often need to maybe adjust the variogram or at least get a good depiction of it and make sure that it's lining up well with our data points. Sometimes it'll be sensitive, sometimes it won't. Often on you know, some projects we end up doing some sensitivity analysis to make sure that our estimation is bracketed by a range of highs and lows based on how the variogram might have been assigned. So three parts of the variogram which are depicted here, we have the range, the sill, and the nugget. So the range is the maximum separation distance at which sample data correlates. So once you go to the end of the range, x-axis is lag distance, um, estimation point is zero. So once you go a certain distance, your sample data set no longer correlate or essentially have a poor correlation. That range distance is used in the algorithm in order to assign the weight. What's also used is the sill. The sill is where the range um, intersects with the plateau of the data set itself. So you can see um, down here where we have data points, the, the green line is our, is our model, and as it becomes asymptotic and parallel to the distance, you would assign a range at that point, and the sill um, is the corresponding value on the y-axis as related to the range. The nugget um, is based on a short range variance, so as soon as you move laterally along the x-axis, you immediately jump up on the y-axis, and that represents a short, uh, short range variance, um, and it's a shift on the y-axis. It's called the nugget because it was really based out of the mining industry, the gold mining industry, so if you can imagine a small little gold nugget, as soon as you move away from that high-grade gold, there's a very significant change in correlation, and the data are more, the sample points would be much different, and because of that, um, you can shift your variogram and start out at a higher place along the y-axis. So those are the basics of Krieging, ordinary Krieging, that is. Now I'm going to discuss a little bit of indicator Krieging. So indicator Krieging, as I'm going to explain here, is based on a data transformation and then actually using ordinary Krieging. So you define a threshold of your concentration and you ask a question, and that question being, at a said location, are we above or below the threshold of interest? So if we're interested in five micrograms per liter, we could ask the question, are we above or below five micrograms per liter? And then you assign a zero or a one, which is a yes or a no, and you Krieg the data on the zeros and ones. It's essentially a probability estimate, the zero or the one, but it's a yes or a no. Um, what's interesting about indicator Krieging is that, uh, of just um, uh, the binary form, is that it sets us up for indicator Krieging at multiple thresholds, which is a um, highly valuable geostatistical means of furthering our estimates, and as, a, as I'll show, it allows us for um, utilizing additional data than we might normally be able to do. So indicator Krieging at multiple thresholds, so instead of it being just a zero or a one, instead of it being this binary system, you can assign different pr probabilities between zero or one and do essentially the same type of ordinary Krieging on those probabilities. Um, this was developed by mining geologists and engineers to mine at the most efficient level, so they really want to understand not only what the grade is, but what's the probability of the grade being above or below a certain concentration. It brings data into a common unit, that unit being probability, and with that you're able to combine different data types as long as there is a sufficient correlation. I'll go into the CDF, which is shown here on the left as an example. 
So in order to do multiple indicator creaking, um, one technique is to look at the cumulative distribution function in order to understand how the data, um, what, the, what the data distribution is like across a certain concentration. So um, here we have from zero to one, essentially the, the probability and X, uh, the X axis is copper grade. This is all from um, a, a nice little website that describes MIK or multiple indicator creaking. Um, and as you notice, there's various thresholds and they, it, it's preferable that you really break out your thresholds based on breaks and slope of the CDF. So the CDF represents the concentration at different um, percentages and probabilities. And then you can see that within the CDF itself, there are um, breaks and slope where now we can ask the question, are we above or below 0.25% copper? And if you do that across all thresholds, then you're asking a different question. You're not asking what the concentrations are. You're asking what's the probability of it being above, let's say, 55 or 55 or 0.55% copper, which gives a, a different look at how you might analyze a plume or analyze soil concentrations. And what's important about this is it really allows for transforming the data into probabilities of exceeding a threshold. So once we transform data into probabilities of exceeding a threshold, then we're provided a unique opportunity in, in that we can take data from different sources. So we have laboratory data, which is pretty typical for many of our sites, but then sometimes we have screening data, and those screening data are underutilized. So if we can use the screening data, if, they, if there is some correlation between the screening data and the laboratory analytical data, and we can establish that relationship, then we can actually fold the screening data in to the quantification and the prediction of the spatial elements and the, and the concentrations, especially the probabilities of exceeding a threshold. What's important about this um, is that even, at, well, depending on your correlation coefficient, you can evaluate how relevant your data are, how relevant your screening data are, and because the correlation coefficient informs the cumulative distribution function, where the soft data reside on the probability is actually a function of the correlation, the cor correlation coefficient. So in essence, your standard error of your soft data to laboratory data relationship, that actually provides an additional weighting function on the screening data. What that means is you may have data that you don't have as much confidence in. You can still use those data, but they're going to be closer to a probability that is less influential on the prediction. So again, going back to the yes or no, is it above or below a threshold? If you're weighted more towards a 50% probability of being above or below that threshold, then your screening data, albeit have less of an influence, are still used. All right, so just a quick time check here. Um, so tools and example projects. I'm gonna go through a few different tools. There's many geostatistical tools out there. Um, I'm going to describe a few of them that we've looked at recently uh, and in the past. We've been using EVS for a while, um, for example, uh, but also something um, that we've recently developed, which I think is pretty exciting. I'm gonna go through these here, but I wanna Take note that if you're going to even talk about geostatistics, you should acknowledge uh, GSLIB, which is a, um, a library of geostatistical applications. It's pretty um, code heavy in the fact that, you know, you got to um, really get into the code and you compile a Fortran 90 at some point. So um, it's still very useful, but uh, you can tell by its uh, application that um, it's been around for a while and the fact that it's a Fortran 90 code. 
So visual sampling plan. So this can, this comes out of Northwest Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, they developed this really as a part of the US EPA's data quality objective process, and it's very pure to the DQO process in the sense that it um, really asks the hypothesis question and gets in heavy statistical detail towards the type 1 and type 2 errors and reducing those. Um, it's used a lot on, on RAD jobs, on radioactive surface soil remediations where a gridded approach is sort of conventional and, and easy, um, easier. It's difficult to apply on a lot of our complicated subsurface sites because um, doing a gridded approach is uh, pretty inefficient and doesn't allow for um, judgmental sampling plans. We typically prefer dynamic, triad approached um, dynamic sampling plans where we're able to use information, um, incorporate conceptual model information, incorporate other aspects of our, our site and develop our plan around that. Visual sampling plan um, is mostly based on you know, a, a very um, firm, gridded type approach. And I may be slightly over speaking on that, but from what I've seen, I, I think that's pretty pretty straightforward. And it's mostly two-dimensional. But one, one of the great tools that I really like in it is this tool called Add Locations to Reduce Uncertainty. Um, so within the tool, you, you assign or you calculate a reference uncertainty index based on a minimum distance between samples and a threshold, a concentration threshold that you would want to assign it towards. Um, that's concentration T down here, CT. So it develops this RUI, which is the reference uncertainty index, and based on the interquartile range, the mean concentration, and the concentration of interest, it develops a field of high, highest RUI, and then you can use that as a graphical representation of where you might want to add additional samples to your to your site or to your sampling plan. So CTEC EVS, um, this is a highly visual three-dimensional software. Um, Parsons we use this quite often for our 3D models. It's great for its uh, 3D graphics, um, but it's also great for its fairly involved geostatistical applications that really allows you a lot of um, a lot of flexibility in your variogram analysis. And now we're talking about a three-dimensional variogram, so it's a bit uh, more complicated. But you can, you know, you can and you should um, develop the variogram and complete the variogram analysis in order to really um, make sure that your your data are aligned with the Kriegian application that you're using. So one of the, um, one of the components of the three-dimensional Kriegian within EVS is the fact that it has standard deviation that comes along with the process. So this is where we're talking about getting more out of your data. If we're Kriegian in a three-dimensional or even a two-dimensional plume, or soil concentration, we're also deriving the statistics of variance within that Krieg data set. So oftentimes, and, and you need to, this is where you, your variogram needs to be solid, and you need to make sure you assign the sill especially, um, because you can derive standard deviation. Once you have standard deviation, there's a plethora of additional statistics that you can do on top of it. Um, the EVS tool itself comes with a few of those. So confidence is, is one of the tools that comes out of EVS based on the variogram and the, and the uh, variance within the Krieg data set. Um, confidence gives you a percentage of how confident you are to be above or below a certain value. It comes with um, some additional assignments that you need to make. So the statistical uh, confidence factor and the confidence tolerance are two of the parameters that really tighten up like what the percent confidence actually means. And I won't go into too much detail on that. 
beyond confidence, there's also an uncertainty tool. So they developed the uncertainty tool to move beyond just the confidence and the standard deviation because what would typically happen when you plot standard deviation or when you plot confidence is that your standard deviation is highest and your confidence is lowest outside your data um, where you actually have no values. And that's pretty typical, especially of large dilute uh, plumes. We don't have as much data out in the uh, peripheral ends of the distal ends of the plume. So you end up with a high standard deviation and a low confidence. That doesn't mean, mean that that's the best place to sample. So what the um, developers of EVS developed was the uncertainty metric, which then identifies areas of low confidence and highest concentration. So it sort of zooms into and highlights the area of wherever your confidence is highest and your standard deviation, um, I'm sorry, where your, your confidence is low and you have highest concentrations. So it's really looking for where your source area is and you have no data in that area. Going a, a bit beyond that, there's the drill guide. And the drill guide um, does this nice little routine for you. It takes a little bit of time, but it ends up with, uh, you end up with basically a, a data point of where you should sample next. And that's what you see here um, in this brief video. So I'll pause it. Um, so what you can see here is the blue is where we have low uncertainty and then the red is where we have highest uncertainty. And you can see the small white circle in this model is where the drill guide, which is a tool, has highlighted the next drilling location. But I like the drill guide. It's nice. Um, it can be somewhat anticlimactic at times because, uh, as is a lot of times, you know, we as professionals make judgments and we end up with a very fancy statistical tool that basically tells us to go where we would have gone anyways. That's not to say it's not a powerful tool. That's not to say it's not useful. But sometimes it's really a reckoning of um, getting everybody on board with your judgmental sampling plan and that you may have, uh, have enough sample data points to really understand where your next sample should be. Um, but not all the time, not all the times do you have everybody on board with that. So we can run these statistics to say, okay, we have the information that we already need to help mathematically identify where the next sample should be. So let's use those and develop a more robust sampling plan based on the statistics. So here's another example. Um, so this is uh, PCE data, and you can see how the blue areas, which are low uncertainty, but also low concentrations, and they get darker blue as you approach the sample point. So your confidence goes up and you have low concentrations, so it's a more blue region, more blue field within the gridded data set. And then you notice the highest areas of red and drill guide places a point out here where we're in between our data set, in, in between our data points, yet of higher concentrations. So moving on, um, here at Parsons, we've developed a threshold specific uncertainty metric, um, which I think is pretty neat because it takes these similar concepts of where we have standard deviation, but then apply it to a very specific concentration threshold. So we have a concentration of interest, let's say it's an action level of you know, the groundwater standard or some risk-based criteria, we apply that mathematically to the standard deviation um, with a weighting function on the concentration of interest, and then we're able to graphically, uh, semi-quantitatively compare regions of the concentration of interest where we have no data already. So here's an uh, example site. Um, confidential sites have removed all the, uh, you know, scale map and whatnot. I really just wanted to show the data. And you end up with, 
you know, a plethora of data points, and then based on what those concentrations are on those data points and the standard deviation, you end up with this, with this tool that really highlights areas where we may need more information. So the areas of red would be concentration locations of interest. You can see it in between these two data points. You can see even amongst areas where we already have data, there may be um, additional data requirements based on, let's say, the third dimensionality that is not shown here. It's been reduced to 2D, um, or based on the concentration and the standard deviation at the location. So another example, here we have a site, and again, we have our threshold-specific uncertainty metric, our T-sum, and low to high. So high areas are highlighted because they are, again, at the concentration of interest, but also of high standard deviation. So we could look at this graphically and, you know, devise a semi-judgmental, semi-quantifiable -quanti uh, sampling plan based on areas of elevated T-sum. So lastly, you know, this, this tool here, um, because it uses existing data and algorithms that we already have developed in our, our Kriging, we can take what's inherent to the Kriging algorithm, extract that out, and apply it for identifying additional sample locations. Those additional sample locations used in delineation really give you the ability to refine and optimize your sampling plan. So moving on, um, another example of a site would be where we're using 3D modeling and, and really a sort of a triad approach. Um, this is a more formal triad approach, frankly. We have high re resolution characterization. We're using MIP and laboratory data in order to graphically and um, quantifiably estimate and predict what the values are almost in real time. So we're talking a 48-hour turnaround on updating the model and rerunning the algorithms and relooking at the data and saying, okay, what do we think now about the plume and where do we put our next data point? So on this project, we're able to really integrate site stratigraphy and concentrations. So this was a dilute plume with high concentrations in, um, in the finer grain parts of the formation. So it, it is a good example of matrix diffusion. Um, and the MIHP really, really showed that and helped us move around the site as we're implementing the field program and make those real-time decisions in order to delineate the plume and understand how it got to deeper aquifers in particular and where, it's, where the remaining mass is. Um, uh, it's innovative and adaptive, but somewhat kind of a tried, it's kind of like an old approach to us now, I think, a lot of us, but we continue to push it, right? We continue to add new tools to the toolbox and the geostatistical modeling and the three-dimensional modeling really supports um, taking triad beyond what it has been up until now and applying it in a, a more robust way. So conclusions, uh, modeling covers a broad spectrum of disciplines. Kriging and interpolation algorithms are industry standard, but background, background mathematics really should be understood and utilized. Geostatistical tools, including TSUM, uh, can, quote, uncover relationships, correlations, et cetera, that otherwise are underutilized, um, essentially getting more from your data. And uh, I thank everyone for attending today. I hope the webinar was informative, and we can take questions now. Thanks, Jim. Really nice job. Uh, we'll get Patrick to uh, open up the, the Q&A and see if there's uh, questions out there. 
Thank you very much. Yes, everyone in question and answer session will now begin. If you wish to ask a question, you may submit a question via the WebEx in the bottom right of your WebEx screen. Type your question and click send to all panelists. As I just remind you, if you did wish to ask a question via WebEx, please click on the WebEx tab on the bottom right of your WebEx screen. Type your question and click send to all panelists. Thank you. And uh, one thing that I wanted to mention while we're uh, waiting to see if we get some questions in, um, this uh, webinar has been approved for PDH hours for those uh, professional engineers, professional geologists that need it. So if you are interested in that, if you can just reply back to the meeting notice and uh, let me know, we'll get you the uh, information sign-in sheet and uh, get that process for you. Patrick, okay, we have a couple of questions. Um, so one, do you envision TSUM tool being used to potentially reduce over excavation or over remediation? I think because it um, provides a more a more quantitative approach to sampling, I think in the fact that it's going to better delineate a site, I think it does um, inherently reduce the type one or type two errors with an excavation, although um, you could argue that there are other mathematical techniques to do it. So to answer your question, yes, I believe TSUM is going to reduce the uh, potential for over or under excavation based on having um, based on having a more improved sampling plan. Another question here is from Don Kruger. Hi, Don. What are the top three considerations when deciding which modeling method is the best one to use? Top three considerations. Um, I think the top three considerations are whether it's a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional problem, whether it's a soil or groundwater problem, because that may um, sway towards a different tool in terms of uh, you know, groundwater follow, follows a certain pattern or a certain path, whereas a soil contamination um, is pretty stagnant and doesn't move. And three, existing data set. Um, depending on how much data you have, you're oftentimes uh, looking towards multiple tools to, to see which one is the best, and that would be the case here. Uh, I would look at multiple tools at first, do some preliminary analysis on the data spread, and, and help um, look at which, which tool is the best. And I guess maybe fourth, and maybe this is the first one, maybe this is the primary now that I'm thinking through your question a little bit more. Um, what is the question that we're asking? If we're asking very specifically about a certain concentration threshold, then TSUM is exactly designed for that, whereas some of the other tools may push you towards the source area or push you out towards um, you know, beyond where you even think the, a plume or soil concentrations are, the, the, the ability to choose a concentration threshold within TSUM um, gives you a, a direct answer to the question, where do I need more samples at a specific threshold? How acceptable by, okay, I've got a question for uh, Tom Morahan, hey Tom, how is acceptance by New York State DEC um, too? Well, I think as with any regulatory environment, um, the, the modeling and the tools uh, are, are generally acceptable, but they're going to come with um, development of the uncertainty and development of and bracketing in the problem. And within New York State DEC, they're also, they're usually, uh, depending on the regulator and depending on, you know, which person you're talking to, they usually prefer to have some judgmental component to the decisions, which, which I agree with. Um, number two from Tom, would you use this for temporal purposes? Um, well, I think if you're speaking about geostatistics in general, most of the time it's a, a geospatial analysis and then it's for one moment in time, but that doesn't mean three dimensions can't become four dimensions. You simply have to look at the next, you know, time step, if you will. 
So, yeah, I think it can be used um, for temporal purposes, especially on top of the, the three dimensions. So I didn't bring up 4, 4D work, but that's a, a very common next step for our geostatistical and our visualization models. And another question from Roni McCunchen. What is the cost of this modeling software? So the one I showed, which is VSP, Visual Sampling Plan, that's free from Pacific Northwest Laboratories. Again, it's not as um, visual, and it is very DQO-based. Uh, it's very QOP-based. Um, you probably are familiar with the Quality Assurance Protection Plan. Some of those under some projects, especially RAD projects, are very, very heavily focused on, you know, the type 1, type 2 uh, error reduction. That's visual sampling plan. It really does well on that, but it doesn't have a lot of tools for subsurface investigations. So that one's free. Um, EVS, CTEC EVS is um, a commercially available product. They have a website, and you can get the price of that. Um, it can be, uh, it's probably a higher end cost than most softwares that, that we use. Um, and it's based on the size of your company. So if you have a lot of people in your company like Parsons, um, well, we're, you know, we're 15,000 or so, um, the rate structure is based on the number of people in the company. Not the number of users, just the number of people in the company. So. Another question here from William Russo. Does EVS take the geology of the site or small-scale small variability into account when making interpolations? I don't want to overspeak on the software itself. That's probably a better question for the developer of the software, but I can tell you how we use it. Um, it does incorporate geology, so very often we are building geological models, and those geo geological models are then combined graphically with the concentration model. So you would interpolate your geology amongst your boring logs, and then you would fold in your concentrations. And from that, like I showed with our, our one project site where we had the MIP and the soil, uh, soil horizons, we're able to graphically depict where the concentrations are the highest and how those were related to the lower concentrations. In other words, indicating a, a mass, uh, a, a matrix diffusion issue. But there, I'm, I'm thinking it through. I don't know of a direct mathematical algorithm that would it incorporate the soil variability in terms of combining them in, in, into one unit. And those are all the questions in the Q&A. Okay. Could you uh, advance one more slide, Jim? A reminder for everyone that uh, we do have another webinar coming up in a few weeks. Uh, July 8th, Mike Nahir is going to be discussing innovative mine closure and reclamation and talking about some of the best practices that Parsons has applied in doing mine closure and reclamation. So hopefully everyone can join us for that. We will be sending out an announcement for that in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody for participating in the webinar, and especially thanks to Jim for putting this together in the presentation. Great job. Thanks, everybody. And with that, we will close things out. Thank you to all our speakers. That concludes your conference call for today. You may disconnect. Thank you for joining and have a good day.